um, recombineering um, is mediated by recombinases. And recombinases are a different class of enzyme than nucleases. They're not making cuts or double-stranded um, uh, breaks to DNA. Um, in, and they're utilizing homologous recombination. Whereas when a nuclease makes a cut, um, there, as we uh, discussed last time, there's a couple of different mechanisms that can come uh, into play to repair that, that break. And it could be um, an HR pathway. It could also be non-homologous end joining. Um, but in, in these approaches, homology is the key. It's absolutely required. Um, and generally, the more homology you have, the better. And so there's a variety of different kinds of recombinases. Um, integrases also fall under this category. You find them natively in bacteria and in yeasts, and you'll also find a ton of this machinery from viruses, particularly the viruses that infect bacteria, known as phages, bacteriophages. Um, and the bacteriophage lambda is one that's of, of particular interest um, to us. Any questions so far? Okay. So we will we'll talk about um, recombineering uh, with the bacteriophage lambda system now, uh, just because that is one of the most well understood and um, frequently employed uh, under one name or another uh, in the model organism E. coli. And so you have this bacteriophage uh, lambda recombination system. And as you're trying to think about this system or, or any of the other material from, from this unit, um, the one, one thing to, to try to focus on is maybe not to try to memorize all the mechanisms at play, but to really compare and contrast and, and uh, understand how, how this approach is different than, than using a nucleus. So here, uh, bacteriophage lambda has these uh, exo, gam, and beta proteins, and you introduce linear double-stranded DNA into your cell, usually by electroporation, um, the use of some kind of um, strong electrical pulse um, uh, creating a, a very transient electric field that allows uh, DNA into the cell. Um, and then when you've, when you've got these proteins overexpressed, exo, like its name suggests, is an exonuclease. Um, it cuts five prime to three prime. So if you've got your double-stranded DNA, it's going to create through what, what are called three prime overhangs. And we might have briefly discussed this if we talked about restriction enzymes uh, back in the molecular cloning discussion. Um, and so you've got this, this, the, this um, mostly double-stranded DNA that uh, is intended to have, a, a, that has this flanking homology to the genome somewhere that effectively directs it. Then you've got this beta protein from the lambda phage, um, and beta is going to bind to this three prime um, single-stranded DNA. It's it's an annealing single-stranded annealing protein, um, and it'll interact with a single-stranded binding protein from the native organism. Um, there's this third component, GAM. It's going to prevent uh, the normal uh, recombination uh, machinery and nuclease um, from degrading double-stranded DNA because you know effectively E. coli or any other cell has a lot of repair or other kind of machinery um, to try to, to, to note that, oh, this, this could be wrong, this could be viral DNA, we've got to uh, degrade it. And so viruses naturally have some ability to, to counter that, and we're just repurposing that process here. Um, so then you can get, based on this homology, um, homologous recombination. And uh, when you've got single strand uh, single strands entirely um, rather than just single stranded overhangs. This process most closely mimics um, that in molecular biology of the Okazaki fragment entering sort of the lagging strand during DNA replication. Um, I thought about getting a figure to kind of illustrate that here, but I also thought it would be overkill, so I'm just sort of mentioning that in passing. 
Um, so going back to the ideas um, of targeting and selection, it, it's hopefully clear how the um, homology just kind of naturally directs um, a DNA sequence to what would be its complementary sequence in the genome, um, particularly when single-stranded. Uh, but how would selection or lack of selection work in this case? Well, so if what you want to do is make a knockout, say, to improve production of a particular metabolite, then what you, what you would want to do is take an antibiotic resistance marker. In this case, this is a NEO marker, um, providing resistance to the antibiotic class neomycin or canamycin. And you have these PCR primers with some um, you know, homology region just for amplification, and the blue represents the homology region with the genome. You amplify your cassette, you've got double-stranded DNA um, encoding an antibiotic resistance marker, and, you know, in order for this to work well, you, you, you probably want this cassette to have its own promoter, which isn't shown here, and you want it to be constitutive um, so that that antibiotic is a resistance marker is actually always being made. Um, so then you electroporate it into cells and you get this recombination and then you can plate on the antibiotic neomycin and see which colonies gave you, res um, you know, exhibit resistance and, and are able to grow. Um, so one pitfall of this approach is if this homology region is relatively short, shorter it is, the lower your efficiency, but the larger it is, uh, you also, up after a certain point, your efficiency also drops because the longer this entire cassette is, the more difficult it is for it to both get into the cell and get into the, to the right region. So one of the things that uh, a common pitfall is that, um, you know, you might have a, a short region and you've got potentially, uh, uh, so while you're doing this, you would be overexpressing those lambda phage genes that we've um, just described, um, but you can still get some some additional unwanted exonuclease activity or, or degradation. And so, if you've got really short um, flanking homology to begin with, it's common to see the resistance phenotype. So, growth on your plate uh, of colonies um, that look like they've all got the insertion, and then when you actually do some additional kinds of verification, colony PCR, genome sequencing, what have you, you will frequently find that this antibiotic resistance marker is not at the location that you wanted it to be at, but it has gone somewhere else into your genome. Um, and so that's one reason why it's really critical um, to have longer regions here. Um, you can also do this approach um, in a few different ways where you, uh, I guess a few alternatives, some of which are non-selectable, um, some of which are just um, selectable, but in kind of a different way. So this isn't a, an ideal title here. Um, but what is being done in this case is say that you want your, your uh, you want a gene substitution. Maybe you want to introduce a feedback resistant variant in a metabolic pathway, uh, but you don't want, for some reason, uh, the native version to be made. Um, and so if you want that kind of replacement um, and you want it to be scarless, one option that you have is to have your gene Y, let's say, cassette have no kind of, of scar. Uh, but in order to do that, you would want, ideally, a, a marker um, that's not only selectable, but counter-selectable. So counter-selection is this idea that you can tell which cells don't have something, uh, and you can select for that trait. So there are some genes that encode enzymes where you can add one chemical, and if that chemical is present, all cells that don't have that would die. Uh, thus, like an antibiotic resistance, thus allowing that cell um, to survive. And then when you try to remove that, you can add a different chemical and, um, you know, any, any cells um, 
that still have it would die. Um, and so that's kind of what's shown here with gal K um, selection, counter selection strategy. There's a positive selection step where you've exchanged a gene X with this gal K. And then in step two, you put in your gene Y. And so it just takes longer. And sometimes that can be, you know, a deal breaker. But um, at the end, when you've done this, and then you do your negative selection, and you look for just the ones that lost gal K, if you've done this right, you've got a clean um, switch from gene X to gene Y, and you were able to do selections along the way, your final strain um, is one that maybe you could consider non-selectable in, in some ways. Um, another approach is that you just kind of combined your gene and uh, your antibiotic resistance marker onto one cassette and give the flanking homology on either side so that you had a gene and now you've got a gene plus antibiotic resistance. And that might be bad, especially if you wanna do this serially or sequentially. Um, so what's shown here with the triangle is a strategy that people commonly employ where you can introduce other viral sites um, that then when you um, expose the cell to a particular condition, um, allow essentially the removal of whatever's between two of these sites. Um, the, the, you know, the, the detailed mechanisms there are, uh, uh, I think, beyond what I'll, I'll get into here, but there are recombinases that can just do that kind of, and one of them is, is, is almost called, uh, or nicknamed at least, a flip recombinase. 